Greetings Woodlice fans! Hiya! Very special one today. Got some brilliant news yesterday. In fact, two awesome things happened to me yesterday. Number one, I won the uh, the award but that I've been entered for, um, like a gold medal, number one. Uh, and the, the category was best class or activity. I can only assume on the internet. So welcome to this award-winning Woodlouse show. The other thing that happened that was even better was during yesterday's show, which is the same as this one, someone said that they liked my Woodlouse voice. Oh, I have never felt more like a science communicator. So we're gonna go on a Woodlouse hunt in a few minutes and you will hear my Woodlouse voice. Um, but first of all, if you've looked at Woodlice on the internet, one of the first things you learn is that they are crustaceans. What does that mean? You read a little bit further and the internet says they're related to crabs. What does that mean to be related to a crab? So at Theory of Science we always go into far too much detail. I'm going to draw you a family tree. Three and a half billion years ago life begins on planet Earth and it's just a uh, imagine Earth without any life. There's no plants, there's no moths, there's no animals, there's no categories of live things. It's just one little tiny thing that is alive. So we say that like the tree of life has begun with that one thing, okay? I'm using brown to be, you know, like a tree because this is what we call an evolutionary tree that we're about to draw, but it's not actually very good, is it? It's just black. So this one tiny little thing pops up three and a half billion years ago and then things start to branch off, okay? So there are three main branches. Uh, one of them, what this little thing changes a bit and evolves to be bacteria, which we will look at in story time, but isn't really relevant to us at the moment. Um, and then this other branch quickly branches off into something called archaea. Again, if you know how to pronounce these or spell them, you let me know. Um, and the final branch, which is the one we're interested in, becomes the eukarya. <laughs> I didn't st study Latin at school. But the eukarya, there we go. And then the eukarya splits into different kingdoms. Three different kingdoms. We are interested, so these are kingdoms here. This is just evolving. This is like creatures that are all the same, one being born slightly different, like maybe its neck is a bit longer, maybe it's got a deep hole in its cell so that it can detect where light is coming from, so it can hide in the shadows, see? So other creatures can't hide in the shadows and some creatures now can hide in the shadows and hiding in the shadows means they survive, so they have more babies and then those babies are born with an accidentally another thing slightly different and this is how creatures branch off and evolve. So one of these kingdoms is the animal kingdom. So we've now got the animals are separate from like bacteria, see? And humans and woodlice, we're all in the animal kingdom. So we'll stick with this one, but the animal kingdom quickly splits up into something called um, phylums. And the mollusks go one way. So they're a totally different animal now. That's like octopuses and squids and that kind of thing. Uh, snails and mollusks. And the animals also split into a group called the um, chordata. Chordata. That's an important one because uh, we're those. Mammals are chordata. And the other one they split into, which if you would last fan you'll have heard of, is arthropods. There's loads more going on here, but we're just going to focus on the relationship between woodlice and humans and woodlice and crabs. So arthropods, there are more arthropods on Earth than any other kind of uh, phylum. The horseshoe crab, which I'm going to mention later, is an arthropod. Um, and then these different phylums split again into classes. And one of those classes is crustaceans. OK, so this line here is all the creatures on the planet are crustaceans. Uh, so woodlice are one of the few crustaceans that do live on land. So crustaceans like crabs and lobsters and stuff, obviously most crustaceans that we know of live in the sea. And then the crustaceans split into a group called isopods, which are the woodlice, and the crabs and the lobsters, they go a different way. 
So that's what we mean when we say that wood lice are related to crabs and lobsters. We mean that they have a common ancestor quite a long time ago. So this is where humans are. So if you go back, back, back in time, when our last ancestor, um, the last time we were related to a wood louse was some kind of little creature here. But we're talking really long, long, long periods of time. Like, um, we reckon that isopods came about in like the Carboniferous period, you know, like when the land was a sort of beautiful, massive rainforest and loads of carbon was being locked into beautiful trees and there were dinosaurs and stuff. So this happened a really, really long time ago. So I've got two pairs of antennae, one to sense like chemical things, like maybe whether something around them is acidic and one for tactile. So like actually just to touch stuff and work out where they're going. Um, and four sets of jaws. What? Um, isopods have compound eyes. What does that mean? Like this got one of these so I can show you see so that is a, a very vague representation of how wood lice and flies and all isopods see how cool is that hello <laughs> um right so so as you can see they evolved a lot there's like 5,000 different species species would be right at the end of that evolutionary tree 5,000 different species of wood lice and they live everywhere they've adapted to be just all over the place they're in tropical rainforests living in trees they're in mountains and um, some of them live in caves they um the, there's some in the desert like they've evolved to be pretty much sort of waterproof so they don't lose any water so they can survive but they are crustaceans they live on every continent apart from antarctica but they are crustaceans so they need to keep quite moist now the other cool thing you learn very quickly about wood lice is that They've got all different kinds of lungs, like some of them have two pairs of lungs, some of them have three, some of them have five pairs of lungs, and some of them have gills. So it's on gills um, that we're going to base our little activity that we're going to do now. I wanted to tell you a bit more about gills. You will need a small bowl, some food colouring, some remains of yesterday's show in there, but I'll put some more in. Put a drop of food colouring into your bowl, and like, a little drop of water, but don't go crazy with the water because we need to be able to see the dye. The only other thing you need is two pieces of toilet roll. So I couldn't have done this activity first lockdown, but I, th I think second now, lockdown will be okay. We're only going to use two sheets. So I'm going to put a drop of water in, but not too much. Yeah, so um, wood lice have, adult wood lice have seven pairs of legs. And on the first five pairs, They've got these teeny tiny little flaps um, and those flaps kind of act like gills. So obviously we have lungs, we breathe oxygen in from the air and then breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, certain wood lice that have these little gills, they absorb oxygen through these tiny little flaps on their legs. Um, but they, they need water to do it. So the water is they need to be moist because the oxygen dissolves into the water and then when it's dissolved in the water then it can pass through into these tiny little flaps that are absolutely filled filled with blood so the oxygen quickly gets into the bloodstream um, and the gills when I say they're teeny tiny what I really mean is they have a big surface area so have a look at one of these sheets of toilet roll um, it has what we call a very big surface area that means that all the mass of the toilet roll like most of the stuff that the toilet roll is made of is exposed to the air. See? All that and all that. So what I'd like you to do first of all is just put dip that piece of toilet roll in some food going. 125 people, you are my favourite people on the planet right now. I can't believe you are watching me dip bog roll into food colouring in order to learn about wood lice. Alright, so as you can see, very quickly the toilet roll has absorbed the food colouring. I'm gonna stick that onto this waterproof fire helmet from my fireworks lesson the other week. The other piece of toilet roll, uh, Beth, are we meant to add water? You can add a little bit of water. I mean, food colouring is quite expensive. <laughs> you don't have to have, add water if you don't want to. I'm just watering mine down a bit. Get your other piece of bog roll and fold it in half and then fold it in half again and then fold it in half again and then fold it in half as many times as you can. And what you're doing is you're creating a piece of toilet roll that does not have a very big surface area. So most of the mass of the toilet roll is now inside there and not exposed to the air. So dip that bit in for the same amount of time. You've got to really squish it. Julian says, whoa, that's good. <clears throat> there we go. 
So that is also covered in blue, just like your other one was. But if you unfold it, ba -ba -ba, hopefully you will see. <laughs> I have to say, if you if you um if you Google like volcano activity online, you get a lot of very cool people blogging about their activities. Google woodlouse activity, not so many. I, I have had to create this myself, but hopefully it serves to um to explain to you what's going on. So if you unfold it, you'll hopefully see that it's a lot less blue. You might even, um, someone sent me a photo yesterday that theirs had lots of little white lines on because the food colouring hadn't been absorbed right in the middle of the toilet roll. So if we compare those, can you see that this one with the big surface area is a lot darker than this one. And that's basically how gills work, is they have a very big surface area so that any oxygen that dissolves into the water goes straight into the bloodstream of the woodlouse. Right, um, I think it might be time for us to go on a woodlouse hunt because story time this week, which we'll do at the end, is about really how you shouldn't fiddle with living things. So I, I just couldn't bring myself to have a woodlouse here to show you because what if I don't put it back in the right place with its friends and I fiddled with it anyway. So you might have some woodlouse, in which case you can look at yours while I'm doing this next bit. But I'm going to go, I have a very beautiful but quite clingy two year old downstairs. So I'm going to have to tiptoe down my stairs now, sneak out the front door, and we're going to go and find some wood lice, and I'll tell you about any different kinds that we find. I think we should be able to find some wood lice, and I'll tell you a bit more about what they eat. Okay, we had, had an attic clear out um, the other day, so I'm just negotiating a bed. I thought about tidying up, but I thought it may, makes it more interesting for you, doesn't it? Okay. I'm going to lift up my recycling bin and I'll see if I can find you a wood mouse. Right, here we go, here we go. I'm hoping to find two different species. Can you hear me okay? I don't know why I'm still whispering. Oh yes, look at these guys. What is that? Yeah, don't know. Oh, that's a huge one. So we know from the size of this guy that that is definitely a common shiny Woodlouse, one of the biggest in the UK, the common shiny. And down here, oops, where was it? There we go. I think that one is a common rough. The common rough are a bit smaller. Different woodlice have different behaviors. Some of them are runners. They just run really fast away. Some of them are rollers. They roll into a tight little ball when you disturb them. And some of them are clingers. They just sit dead still if they're feeling a bit threatened and they've studied like the social lives of the clingers and found that some of them are shyer than others some of them are really shy and stay still for a long time and some of them don't stay still for as long they've got six pairs of legs when they're born and then they molt as all woodlice do throughout their lives as they grow they they've got an exoskeleton like a skeleton on the outside and when they get too big for it they shed it so if you've seen the photo I put on my Facebook page, the back end goes first and then the front end goes a bit later on. So I found a woodlouse that was just coming out of its beautiful white shell that it had shed. And they, sh they shed their shells within 24 hours of being born. And then they've got all seven pairs of legs. Um, so as you can see from where they're living here, they eat mainly uh, like leaf litter, decayed wood, fungi. They, they can also eat each other. Uh, and yeah, they also eat uh, their own poop. It's called copro 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 cop coprophagy coprophagy copro copro. They eat their own poop. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Do the legs get replaced? Oh no, they don't shed their legs. So they start off with. Right, I'm going to try. I'm going to be really cruel and try and flip this one over to show you the bottom. Last time I tried, it. It clung to the stick and I got a really good view. I don't want to bother it. Again, story time is all about animal bothering and I don't want to freak them out. Shall I try a different one? Hey, you. Come here. Oh, you're so relaxed. I don't want to bother you. Can you come here so we can see your bottom?
No, okay. I don't think these big ones are gonna to cling to my stick. Let's have a look under another thing. Come on, matey. I want to show you the lungs. So underneath the woodlouse, you'll see two white dots. And those are its lungs right at the back. Oh, where, where are you? Come on, mate. Not a bad if I just use my finger. Would you prefer that or would you hate that? Oh, look, yeah. Okay, so we won't stay with this guy for long. But can you just make out it's got some right at the back, some little white blobs? I think those are its lungs. I love that I have a wood louse voice now. Yeah, you can see its lungs really clearly, eh? Right at the back there. Right, okay, sorry for that. Oh, good, it's escaped. Okay, right, let's leave them alone. Whew. Nor says cool, thanks, Nor. Oh, I didn't tell you about whether they were pests or not, did I? So they're not pests. They're actually really good for the environment because they break down leaves into tiny little bits. They're like nutrient recyclers. Um, and the other way they're really useful is that they store pollution, like heavy metals, in their body. So animals cope with pollution in different ways, but um, woodlife store it. So if you want to know how polluted an area is, scientists can collect woodlice, which are obviously quite big, quite easy to collect, and test them, and we know how much pollution is in that area. Um, yeah, the other thing that I want to tell you, before we do story time, is the females. They've got little pouches, kind of like kangaroos. So if you, if you flip one over, you can see those two little white dots, which are their lungs. But you might, if you're really lucky, see lots of other bulging pouches. Um, the female woodlouse, like, stores the sperm from the male until the it's a good time to like release the woodlice like I don't know sort of everything's safe I guess um and yeah the the eggs grow inside these pouches and then the woodlice crawl out when they're born so it kind of looks like the woodlouse is giving birth although obviously uh, they're not mammals and they're not doing that oh very good question um Eleanor says she's found woodlice in rocks and in the stream can they swim yes so some of them uh, can still swim, some of them have obviously got gills, and some of them, um, when they're disturbed, they do run into water, and most of them can survive being submerged in water for quite some time. Right, um, it's time for story time. Are you ready? So like I say, they're related to crabs, so I got this story time about crabs. It turns out the, the crab that I'm going to show you today is a horseshoe crab. It's not actually a crab at all, is it? It's a blue one there because biology hates me, the horseshoe crab is an arthropod. It's not, it's not actually a crab, but anyway. It's a great story, so here we go. <laughs> Do you ever eat food off the floor? No! Of course you don't! Almost certainly not. Probably. Well, maybe sometimes. I mean, it depends, doesn't it? But we all know now, don't we, that there are tiny, invisible bacteria, viruses all around us um, that can make us poorly. So how you behave is up to you. But if you went to the doctors, say, for an injection and they dropped the needle on the floor and then they just picked it up and carried on injecting you, you would think, what? No, that's, that's not right, because we all know that hospitals are very, very clean places. Everything's very sterile. All the germs on everything have been... Uh, killed and we do regular tests hospitals do regular tests to make sure that even um, the medicine like all the equipment is totally free from bacteria and viruses but there is something that can hurt people that these regular tests don't show up when a bacteria dies Tiny little molecules are released from its cell wall, and these are called endotoxins. And they come out when the bacteria dies, and they can make us sick, and they can be there even when bacteria aren't present. And these regular tests that we do, they don't pick up endotoxins. So, before 1956, the only way we had to test for these endotoxins was to inject thousands and thousands of rabbits, and then if we got poor, if they got, got poorly, then we knew that there were endotoxins there. But eventually, in 1956, a scientist called Fred Bang discovered a chemical that could be added to medicines and things that would pretty much instantly detect 
endotoxins. The problem is, it's only found in one place. It's found in the blood of a creature called the horseshoe crab. Now, in certain places around the world, in the warmer months, at night, and especially, this is true, especially when the moon is full, horseshoe crabs come out of the sea and spawn. They lay their eggs. You have to look them up. They are incredible looking creatures. Uh, females lay up to 20 batches of up to 4,000 eggs and the crabs are born and just like wood lice, um, they shed their shells as they grow and grow and grow and then eventually they go back into the sea and they don't return onto the shore for 10 years and we have no idea where they're going so oh well no chance of humans ever getting hold of any horseshoe crab blood i hear you say well no actually at the special time of year when these crabs come onto the shore teams and teams of scientists and lab workers line up on the shore and capture these horseshoe crabs and what they do is they take them back to a laboratory and they, well, they effectively um, harvest their blood. We'll call it milking because it's a slightly nicer word. Um, you will see, this is, this is absolutely true, just in case you were thinking that this wasn't incredibly weird, that horseshoe crab blood is blue. So these horseshoe crabs get, get sort of milked for their blood and then put back in the ocean. What a strange thing to do, but it's totally worth it. So... Horseshoe crab blood contains these little cells called amoebocytes, which protect them from viruses, fungus, bacteria, all that stuff. So what happens is these amoebocytes, they form a gel around the bacteria um, to prevent it from spreading infection. So if a scientist sees this gel in a solution, they know that endotoxins are in there. Um, why? How do horseshoe crabs do this? Well... Horseshoe crabs are invertebrates, and like all invertebrates, they have what's called an open circulation system. So whereas we have blood pumping through like veins and arteries, um, the inside of a horseshoe crab is literally a bloodbath. Their organs, their heart and all that stuff is all just soaked in blood. So the blood flows freely through, through their body. So this means they're very vulnerable to infection. They need a very good, very sensitive immune system. It's better than ours. So human beings, produces substance called LAL from horseshoe crab blood and we use it to test medicines. So millions of people, you might not know what a horseshoe crab is, but especially in America, it's actually a legal requirement that your your um, doc hospital will be using this LAL stuff. So you might owe your life to a horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are very hardy. They have survived for millions of years. They survived an extinction event which killed off um, over 90% of life on Earth. Ooh, well done, you guys. Yeah, so they're, they're very impressive creatures. But unfortunately, there's a bit of a sad end to this story. Um, far fewer females are coming to spawn, unsurprisingly, where they've been caught by scientists before. And actually, 15% of the horseshoe crabs do not survive uh, this blood harvesting process. And they've been killed for fishing bait, so it's not good news for horseshoe crabs. The, the good news is that some researchers are trying to make horseshoe crab blood in the laboratory so so we won't need to harvest them anymore so you know if you're looking for a science job which might involve some some foreign holidays then maybe you can save the horseshoe crab <laughs> the end so you go on that bombshell yeah there's definitely the weirdest story time we've we've ever done um look it up you have to look up like horseshoe crab blood harvesting it's, it's like baby blue it's so weird it's like it's pastely blue color anyway folks <laughs> um thus oh there's my comments um thank you so much for joining me thus ends this week's science show live next week i think we're going to do the big bang we're going to go from very very small things to huge things i think you're only going to need a balloon or an elastic band and we're going to look at the universe and what it's doing and what it might end up doing and do a story time about the Big Bang and all that stuff. And then a week after that, I think we decided yesterday we're going to do rose hips because it's rose hip season. We're going to go back to being very small again. Um, 
thank you so much for coming. I am here every weekend, Saturday and Sunday at 10am. We do a different show and it always involves an activity and it always involves a story time. I also do a home editing lesson on a Tuesday at half past one, if you're a home editing um, person. Then this week we're doing electricity. It's electricity this whole term. So the old ones are on my uh, video section on my Facebook page if you want to have a look at those. Um, if you have enjoyed this and you want to help me out then you could like my Facebook page, that would be totally awesome. I get a very very sad sense of pleasure from people liking my Facebook page so thank you very much. Um, if you go to my Facebook page then near the like button there's a button that says like shop now because that's all Facebook lets you say but that will lead you to my Patreon page. This is a website where you can um, support people with like three or five or ten pounds a month and you get different thank yous for supporting with different amounts. So anyone who supports me with anything per month gets these awesome rainbow glasses. They make you see rainbows um, with a little description of how they work. And the, the big exciting thing for me is um, if you support me with five pounds or more then you get this magazine that I write husband is a graphic designer. Evelyn and Zach, you are very welcome. So that, that helps a lot. I know that a lot of you are already patrons, but I, I have to I have to do this bit, don't I? So yeah, it's a magazine, it's like proper, and it comes out every two months, and it's got totally new content in it. I really don't repeat anything from the lessons. Like, it's very important to me. So um, the next issue is out in January. So if you sign up to support me on Patreon, thank you so much. I am actually getting paid for this. It looks like I'm being really generous and doing it for free, but I very much appreciate the fact that I can carry it on because a lot of you guys are, are funding me. So thank you very much. Ah, oh, Alfred really enjoyed today's lesson and you joined to become a patron. Thank you, Alfred. That is very kind of you. Excellent nagging skills, Alfred. Thanks. Bye, Marta. Yes, all that remains for me to say is a very big bye-bye and thank you for coming and I'll see you very soon. Bye.